the idea is that Uh-oh. Give me one second because I need to click on got it and then <laughs> uh, I was saying please do interrupt me if you have questions. Uh, uh, and you know, people will probably help and shout to stop me because I I literally see nothing uh besides my slides on currently on my screen. So but yeah, uh, as it was said, I will I will introduce to you these ideas of how we can use su superconducting single photon detectors to enable quantum networks or quantum communication and how we're also starting to use these detectors with unprecedented sensitivity to study dark matter so let me start with a you know a little bit of a context or introduction so these are i just wanted to put these pictures here to you know as a refresher for uh younger people especially that uh these are the grand challenges that we have in, in particle physics today, or you know, some of them is not a complete list, uh, but the idea, and this include you know, the dark nature of dark matter in the left, uh, the Higgs boson properties in the middle, and then there's a picture you know, of a you know, big neutrino detector uh, to cover the neutrino sector. These are things that we ought to answer very soon, uh, or we keep you know, trying to you know, dissolidate more about the nature of, of all these things, but they are big challenges in physics, uh, say fundamental physics that we want to answer. That's the ultimate goal that we have here also at Fermilab. Uh, but in order to address this uh, in general, uh, transformative physics discoveries are hand in hand with, uh, you know, transformative uh, technologies uh, to explore nature uh, at, at these levels. We need to be at the frontier of detection technology. And I just wanted to remind people of something that happened in 1965 with Penzias and Wilson uh, were actually uh, studying, uh, you know, uh, radio waves and uh, they put this horn antenna, which is a new instrument. Uh, so these were, you know, they were not, say, you know, researcher physicists. They were, you know, doing research, but on, you know, antennas and they keep having this noise that kept popping up in, in this new instrument. It was a whole new instrument that they developed and they installed, they deployed. And uh, lo and behold, uh, after you know some time, they published this as noise, and then somebody actually from I believe Princeton called them nearby and told them that uh, it's actually not noise that they were this they might be seeing something that they called you know the cosmic microwave background, and that's how we discovered the cosmic microwave background. Then we have now precise measurements of this. It's an old one from WMAP. There are more precise ones. Uh, and then this whole field then, you know, enable uh, a new direction in science. And that was fundamentally enabled by new technologies. So that's something to keep in mind on how we answer these questions. They go hand in hand. So with that in mind, uh, I wanted to go back a little bit farther in history. So now, so what I call 21st century science and technology tools. And there is a new emerging field, which we call quantum sensors, which uh, we believe it's going to be similar to what I described. It's a paradigm shifting technology. It's not only one of them, it's, it's many of them. And one of the, and the idea is that uh, currently they were, you know, pushed by the need or, you know, the desire to enable quantum computers. But more recently, we have used them for enabling quantum communication, and even more recently, to try to use them as a, as a probe of fundamental physics. And the idea of this is that they have new increased sensitivity compared to you know, more traditional standard sensors that uh, many of you might be familiar uh, from you know, high energy physics background. So that's, that's kind of the idea. In this case, uh, I'll specifically focus on you know this acronym, which is SNSPD, which is, stands for Superconducting Nanowire Single Photon Detectors, and how they can enable uh, quantum communication, as I said, and specifically in the part of fundamental physics, probes for dark matter. And why are, are these detectors, these SNSPDs, which is uh, like a picture on the left, I will explain more of them later, but the, they are photon detectors and they achieve these best metrics. So they are sensitive down to 30 milli electron vo uh, uh, volt photons, uh, the very low threshold energy. So just to put it in context, uh, and um, they have over 90% system detection efficiency for a single photon. So one photon, 90% efficiency, uh, low dark count rates as low as uh, one E to the minus five. 
and record time resolutions for a single photon detection of three picoseconds. So these are outstanding metrics that are very hard to find uh, in you know, traditional sensors. And the idea is how do we leverage this or how do these detector metrics, now the technology gets matched into the applications or the physics that they're, we're trying to do. So the first uh, application that I will develop, it's what we call quantum teleportation. So uh, this is a, a protocol in uh, you know, an information a science protocol or a communication, quantum communication protocol, which uh, I think if my graphics work, it will try to do something. So uh, there's a cat that wants to be teleported from, you know, say A in the left to B on the right. Uh, there's one way to do it is, is uh, you either send all, you know, the, the, the classical bits of information, and then you just try to make a copy, but it's not exactly the same cat. The other way is that you actually teleport the whole cat. That's what the one in the left is doing. And uh, the, the zeros and the ones are, you know, a representation that we're actually transmitting, in this case, uh, quantum information. And then the other person with that information can, you know, uh, teleport the cat. So it's actually exactly the same cat. Uh, there is a caveat to that, that it doesn't work exactly that way, uh, that uh, in order to do that, you secretly, uh, in the background, there is a, a quantum channel that's activated, and that's called entanglement. So in order to achieve this protocol, there needs to be a quantum resource uh, that's different from just sending the information directly uh, from A to B, which is uh, what we call quantum entanglement, or it's basically a pair. In this case, what we'll describe a pair of photons that are entangled. And entanglement is a property that's uh, unique of quantum mechanics. You cannot achieve this uh, classically. So that's what we will do in a cartoon. So bear with me. We will go through the details on how this is done, uh, or as much details as we can fit uh, you know, in 20 minutes or 25 minutes. So this is more, again, like layer more deep into the uh, teleportation protocol. So we do this with photons. Uh, and you know you can repeat this with many, 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 many photons to send more information. So the idea will be on the left, you have an incoming photon in green, and then you have this entangled uh, photon pair in the middle. And then when uh, you wanna teleport the information all the way to the right, it says teleported photon. and in order to do that, you use one of the photons from the entangled pair and you make it uh, interfere uh, or interact in what we call the bell state measurement, where there's like kind of explosion. There's not really an explosion, there's just an interaction between these two photons uh, at the quantum level. And when that happens, the other photon that you know le was left you know, hanging on the right, when the bell state measurement is achieved, uh, the photon on the right uh, receives the exact quantum state as the incoming photon. And there is a little bit of a caveat that I will describe uh, in one or two slides, but uh, that's kind of the idea of the protocol. And it's uh, it's all quantum. And then when the information it's uh, teleported on the left, uh, it's distracted on the left, and you cannot clone. There's a no cloning theorem in quantum mechanics. So, okay, so that's it. So. I mean, if you have questions, that's a good time to ask. Uh, or otherwise, we go a little bit more details is how we actually implement the protocol. So typically, we have actually three parties. We have the Charlie, which is the one that produces the, uh, sorry, the one that measures. This, uh, it's what we call the Bell State Measurement. It's the top left. We have Alice, uh, who is the sender, the ones that uh, wants to send the information. And that's an arbitrary qubit, as you say, psi A. Uh, which, you know, in, in the way that we encode the information in the photons is uh, we encode it in the time domain. So it's E for early and L for late. And there is a phase between the two. And then above, uh, which is on the right, is the more complicated one. It's the one that actually produced the entangled pair. So it's a two particle state like phi and it's I, S. So I the layer. It's the one on the left, and signal is the one that will receive the final teleported state. And the idler is the one that goes interact in this beam splitter, that's BS, uh, in Charlie. And then there are two green things, and the green things are the detectors. So remember that we were trying to use SNSPDs to, to do all this protocol. So 
you know, if you want to go on the more computing or information science uh, way to describe these things, is uh, there is a protocol. It says ball creates an entangled pair in one of the four Bell states. There are four possible, you know, combinations or two particles. So it's a one of the possible Bell pairs. Then he keeps the signal photon. That's the one that's kept. Uh, and then he sends the idler photon to Charlie. At the same time or synchronized, Alice sends her qubit to Charlie. And then Charlie performs a Bell state measurement using and um, reading the words, you know, as you will execute the protocol if somebody tells you to do this, by using a beam splitter and two superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. So that's that's the protocol. So with all of the information, you should be able to run this and you know prove that quantum mechanics actually actually works. So there's a little bit of a, a caveat. It, it feels like how is this even possible? Uh, uh, at least it felt to me in the beginning when I was working on this. So I, I don't expect you to follow all the matter, all the details, but I just like give you like the the right content so you can, you know, go work this out yourself or, you know, it's easier to digest. So at the beginning of the protocol, before you do any measurement, there were three particles. There were the photon to be sent from Alice, that's on the left at the top equation, and then the pair is phi plus is. Uh, so it's a three particle state. So that's what you began. You can rearrange the same equation, the same part in the left, the I, uh, A, I, S, uh, it's a mouthful, uh, in now what we call the Bell basis. So you rearrange this, and then you end up with four possible Bell pairs, all these big capital Phi's uh, in the left. And then you also rearrange the indices. You notice how I'm moving the A and the I together, because those are the ones that will interact at Charlie. And then there are some, you know, kind of uh, interesting terms uh, in the parentheses. So that, that's what happens. So in, at the end of the day, what we do is we project this uh, state. So when we do the Bell state measurement, we will measure two photons and uh, we will destroy the wave function for those two photons and will be kept only with the signal photon. And when you do that, so you actually project typically into phi minus, which is the bottom one uh, on the bottom equation, and then you end up with this form. So it looks pretty similar to the original one, but you notice that there's a you know a sign that's flipped, and this the the face uh, is also you know flipped between the early and the late uh, to go exactly to the original one that Alice wanted to send, uh, and it just turns out that uh, it's okay because this is a, just a unitary transformation uh of the original uh information and that's the trick so you actually need to tell uh the receiver which one of these four states you measure to be able to fully teleport because each one of these uh measurements represents one of the poly uh you know matrix to uh then perform the back the unitary transformation and get back the original qubit so, so then to teleport, you also need, at the end of the day, two bits of classical information to represent the four possible outcomes of the Bell state measurement for a two-particle, you know, interaction. So that's it. That's how the whole protocol works and how you actually were to implement it, you know, in math and how, you know, like you convince yourself that this is actually working. Uh, so there is some requirements for, for the detectors, as I was trying to say, how does this tie back to the SNSPDs, is that uh, it, everything is enabled uh, by the time resolution of the detectors. As I said, the information of the, uh, like the zeros and the ones, the bases of the photons are encoded in their time information. So to get a sign minus the projection, uh, which is B in this case, in this picture, what needs to happen is that you need to look at the so the bell state measurement experimentally. So now trying to be more experimental, it's constructed of a beam splitter, a 50-50 beam splitter, uh, which is this square that's tilted in 90 degrees or 45 degrees with an, a line in the middle. That's the picture. Uh, that's on figure A. And then one detector one output and detector two outputs are connected to the SNSPDs. And what you need to see in the detector is detector one is to click early. That's the bucket on the left most part of the uh, of the graph. And detector two needs to click late. Or the other way around, detector one needs to click late. So that's a little bit farther in the second bucket. And detector two needs to click early. So 
And the only way you can resolve that is by having detectors with very good time resolutions, because the closer these two buckets are, the more information per unit time you will be sending. But if you put them too close together, then you cannot disentangle them in time. So everything is set by the time resolution of your detectors. The dark count of your detectors will matter, because if you have a lot of dark counts, then you will think that you have the right detection when you don't. Uh, and also the efficiency of measuring the photons. So let's say if I run this like a, a thousand times, uh, my efficiency, the efficiency of my detector, like, you know, most silicon detectors uh, is like 30%, then you will lose 70% of your data. So you want very efficient detectors, uh, you know, ideally high 90s percents on, on them for, you know, the communication purposes, because everything is at the single photon level. So that's why SNSPDs uh, can achieve that. As I just said, I hinted, this is a, a picture of an actual uh, SNSPD uh, detector that's used for these communication uh, protocols. You see that they're kind of small in, uh, in area. So this one particular one is 16 micron circle uh, diameter and you know the separation between each. Uh, so the nanowire is the gray uh, part so and you see that the cable or the you know superconducting detector wire it's kind of running left and right and what we call a meander it kind of goes back and forth to try to cover enough you know surface area to be able to achieve the sensitivity that i mentioned before in this case the nano wire itself is 100 nanometer wide and then you go back and forth uh doing this and when you measure the detection efficiency, you measure a 90% for a single photon, low dark count rates uh, of 1 E minus 5. These are all kind of best on their you know, respective uh, metrics. The, to measure all of them simultaneously, it's very hard. So that's uh, just I wanted to put that caveat, but I just wanted to highlight the best that has been achieved, the state of the sure. art in individual metric. Yeah. Uh, Mauro has a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Christian, uh, uh, could you go back one slide, uh, please? Mm -hmm. This one? Uh, so I, I take it from figure B and C that in one case, in, in B, either detector one or detector two gets the signal first than the other. And in case C, uh, both detectors, uh, one detector uh, get the two signals, but it's in the same detector, but uh, with a lag time, lag difference. Um, yeah. How is that related to the Psi plus minus? Uh, uh, why, why is it different for, for, for that Psi plus minus? Could I have expected that the Psi plus minus is that the one that will give the output in figure C in B and the Psi plus, in the, the one in figure C. From so you're the trying to map what, uh, why, why psi minus means uh, one detector and the other. Uh, so like detector one and detector two, well, psi plus, it's only one detector. Right. Yeah, so that's uh, that has to do with the way that the, what this, uh, what the this- The basis, right? The basis means, yeah. So I don't have it written down, but uh, you can figure it out basically. Basically, so if you if you write down what each uh, bell pair, what which each one of these means, you you should be able that with the fact that you have a beam splitter, it's a little bit you know there's a little bit of math that you need to do, and then you will figure out that uh, like phi minus uh, it's always like this, and okay. sa and phi ma plus is always like that, and the other two actually are more tricky. You will see that there. Are, they're both arrive in the same detector. So you cannot really tell them apart unless you have, you know, a photon number resolving and maybe some non-linear uh, optics. So these are the ones that can be achieved with just the beam splitter. If okay. you want to the other- two, the way the, the, the basis is constructed and yeah, the fact exactly. that you have a beam splitter in the middle. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Because you, mm. the way it works is that you need to get like uh, the the spatial, like the actual, the physical at, at the beam splitter, the waveform needs to be of a particular way because they are photons, right? So they need to um, they need to be symmetric uh, and they split of uh, the two photons, right? It's a uh, okay. boson. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, one fast question from myself. When you mean uh, the dark count, so that would be that uh, it's like noise. So when it says... It yeah, measures... sorry. Yeah, it's noise. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes what happens is that the edges of these detectors are, you know, you need to curl back. So, so there is actually current. I will explain this in the next slide. Uh, so there is current flowing in these detectors when it's superconducting. And if there is some imperfections, uh, uh, maybe vibrations or anything or temperature related things, uh, it can just click. Uh, but it wasn't a real photon that hit it. And, you know, the higher that number is, uh, the worse your protocol will be, because it's at the end of the day, it's, uh, if you think about it, it's like signal to noise. It's like having this detector here, like having a bunch of clicks happening randomly uh, in time. So you don't want that uh, to, right, to thank happen. You. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions? Looks like not. So, okay, that brings me to the detector. Uh, so the way they work, the detection mechanism, so this is like a one small section of a nanowire. Uh, so we understand the process. So typically uh, in time, in one, uh, the kind of, say top, middle, uh, middle at the top, uh, number one, it means it's a fully superconducting state, all nice. Uh, and, and then, and two, a photon arrives and it hits the nanowire. That creates a hotspot in that area. It breaks some of the Cooper pairs that are you know, necessary for the superconductivity to uh, be happening. And then because current wants to keep flowing that direction, there is some nonlinear process. So now it meets a little resistance. So then it, it gets worse. It's a nonlinear, uh, you know, positive feedback mechanism. So it gets amplified. Uh, so the hotspot grows, and then it grows until you know it's across the whole sectional area of the nanowire. And uh, when that happens, the resistance goes in a very small time scale from zero, basically, to a few kilo ohms. So what you can do is you, in parallel to the nanowire, you put uh, a line that goes uh, to ground with a 50 ohm, you know, or some kind of impedance. And then when that photon is detected, all the current will be diverted into the your readout circuit. That's kind of the, the plot at the bottom. And as I said, this happens in very fast time scales, you know, order of like a one picosecond, uh, depending on the nanowire. So that then you need to go in the details of how you make these nanowires, which we can discuss, you know, later, but it's uh, you know probably beyond the scope of of this talk. But you can ask questions if you're interested. And typically, they operate between one and four Kelvin because they're superconducting. Uh, ideally, lower uh, gives you more, you know, room for uh, for them to go to even lower thresholds that we'll discuss. And so far, they've been like kind of they go to detector for this kind of protocols because they can detect single photons from the UB to the mid infrared. Uh, okay. And uh, this, I just wanted to go uh, now onto the experimental part of the quantum network. So this is uh, the idea uh, here at Fermilab, uh, you know, DOE and the United States, which is uh, we're trying to go and build a quantum network infrastructure towards the quantum internet. There is a blueprint, uh, a vision that, uh, you know, in, in the future, let's say I don't want to put it uh, here, the whole, the whole US is going to be covered with this quantum networks that will have all these protocols. So teleportation is one of the protocols and you can get you know, more fancy. And there, there's some ideas that we're working on to expand on these protocols. And the OE is putting a lot of effort in all the national labs to create this infrastructure. So we have here, you know, like Fermilab where I am, then it's Argon National Lab. It's about 50 kilometer fiber link. Uh, and then we can go all the way to downtown Chicago. You see like the corner of, you know, the Michigan Lake. And we have fiber laid out in all these regions, and we're running these protocols now and what we call long distance, uh, you know, quantum communication. So you need to send, you know, these photons that, you know, it's one photon and needs to go all the way 50 kilometers. So there are losses, so there are challenges with real world implementation of all these things. You can do these things easily in the lab, but there's a challenge and it's a little bit of a, you know, at the intersection of engineering and physics uh, in order to deploy all this uh, infrastructure to, to be able to use uh, these resources. Just to put it in context, uh, we have to build all this infrastructure for classical networks, uh, even to have this meeting. And this 
you know, was originally created for, you know, the use of the Large Hadron Collider and experiments uh, that we needed to interconnect like this. And we, we needed to have this backbone communication to be able to run physics experiments. So that's why uh, the U.S. is interested on these kind of things. This is the, all what I presented is by no means only my work. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And uh, this is actually not a complete picture of all the collaborators that, you know, work on this. Uh, and I've been learning from, uh, I'm a particle physicist by training. I did my PhD on CMS. So uh, I'm an LHC person. And in the last few years, I've been learning about this fascinating world of, you know, quantum information science and superconducting detectors. So I'm, um, you know, I'm more of an expert than I was obviously at the beginning, but uh, I learned from very good people uh, among some of them in this collaboration. So I wanted to pass that along. And this is uh, a little bit going deeper into what we're doing at Fermilab. So at Fermilab, I'm actually sitting here at D0 at the bottom. Uh, uh, D0 was one of the experiments that discovered uh, the, the top quark at Fermilab in the Tevatron ring. So we're all the way here at the bottom. Uh, and uh, then there is the other building, the Feynman Computing Center, FCC, which is across the ring. Uh, and that's about like 2.5 kilometer uh, fiber connecting the two labs. And then there is another fiber with this arrow that goes to Argonne National Lab, the one that I showed is 50 kilometers long. And there is that's what a typical experiment set up in one of the optical tables that's actually downstairs in the lab uh, operating, uh, which has multiple you know optics in the table to be able to run uh, these experiments. So I think that's what I wanted to highlight. And this, you know, the same picture now kind of more layout. So that's for people that have been at Fermilab, that's uh, the big building. It's uh, Wilson Hall and the Feynman Computing Center is a little bit to the left. And then you need to go all across the rink to go to the uh, where I am now at DAV to connect these two labs uh, and, and run these protocols. So this is what it looks like conceptually to run the teleportation uh, protocol that I described before. I, I kind of wanted to highlight that uh, now when you want to go and implement this uh, in even in a schematic diagram, it gets far more complex than you know the, the math and the equations that uh, I described before. And that's something that uh, it's it's interesting. It's a very challenging and it, it mixes uh, a lot of technologies, so superconducting technologies here in the middle at uh, Charlie, the Bell State measurements is one and two are actually the superconducting detectors. Uh, they they need to be run at cryogenic temperatures, so you need to know how to operate cryostats, uh, dilution refrigerators, or you know some kind of fridge that goes below one Kelvin in this case. Uh, then you have a lot of optics. Uh, you have interferometers, you have uh, ele electro-optic modulators, very fast electronics, so uh, actually the... Uh, I forgot to mention, but things uh, I I think there were I saw some people that I know that are more on the experimentalist side. Uh, we are working here with signals that are uh, you know 10 gigahertz and above, so very fast, uh, cutting edge electronics, which poses a lot of challenges for the electronics because that's what the optics likes to do. Uh, optics is uh, doesn't have any problem with going fast; it actually wants to go fast, and it's the electronics that needs uh, you know to to keep up. So there are some very interesting challenges, and we use cutting edge, as I said, uh, high speed electronics and the quantum sensors. They all go together to be able to pull up uh, this this experiment. And some expertise that we have, for example, with time to digital conversion and in you know high energy physics experiments, has been very handy for running these experiments because you need to synchronize all these sites, you need to make all the measurements, and then you know create a band level uh, information to be able to reconstruct all the data and make sure that you have the teleportation uh, protocol achieved. So, so that's kind of uh, you know everything in a nutshell. If you do have some questions about this slide, we can we can go back to it. But if I go into the details, we're gonna miss out on other things that I wanted to to show. So as I said on the left, that's what a typical optical table that run one of these protocols looks like in one of the labs, one of the endpoints of this protocol. So there could be one, two, or three. Uh, and the top right figure is uh, one of the fridges that we use. In this case, it's a sorption refrigerator, which have uh, where the hands are there are two actually fiber coming into the SNSPD detectors at the top plate, which is the coldest plate in this cryostat, which goes to 0.8 Kelvin, so 800 millikelvin. 
And at bottom is one of our students working, uh, monitoring uh, the what we call the teleportation fidelity, which is the final figure of merit to you know be able to tell how well your teleportation is going. So let's go a little bit on the final results. So we did uh, the first experiment uh, with final results we published in 2020 uh, in PRX Quantum, the first edition of this journal. And the left shows the, let's go to the right, which is the bot, like the money plot. But in the left, it has a lot of physics that I wanted to show. So the right plot shows what we call the teleportation fidelity in uh, like uh, three different quantum states. So pure early state. So let's say a zero, pure late, a pure one, or an, a plus, which is a early plus late or zero plus one, if you want to you know, remember your quantum mechanics uh, classes. Uh, and in the height, so the, the closer to one you are, it's perfect teleportation. If you want to do this classically, you can only get to two thirds, so about 66%. Uh, and you see that for all the teleportation bases, for all the states, we get far above the classical limit, this uh, line, and we get very close to one in most cases. Uh, you see a kind of a drop on the plus and because to to measure the plus you need to use interferometers and interferometers are very hard to stabilize uh, and they also have additional losses so that's why the difference between the early and the late is so experimentally to do early or late teleportation it's kind of easy uh relatively speaking once you have everything set up to do the the mixed state it becomes hard because you need to now control interferometers over long uh time scales with very high precision and another thing that you need to control is the plot on the left that I promised to explain. Uh, sorry, before I forget now that I read, we performed this over 44 kilometers of, uh, of optical fiber. And one of the important figures of merit, it's what we call the Hong O Mandel or Hom effect. So at the beam splitter here, sorry, in the middle, you have a beam splitter uh, and then the two photons arrive and they, they need to interact, undergo this quantum mechanical interference process and then you measure them in the detectors with the questions that we had before you know this this pattern that needs to happen in the time of arrival of the detections uh, but in order for the protocol to arrive uh, those pictures that we show and the question it's a requirement that the two photons need to be indistinguishable so the wave function is symmetric uh, under the conditions that all the quantum uh, states are indistinguishable if you want to remember you know your quantum mechanics 101 and one of the properties, uh, it's actually the time of arrival. So in this case, we change the time of arrival of the two photons, the delta time between the two photons. And you see uh, that when you go, when you detune all the way to the left or all the way to the right, you see a constant number of coincidences. So that means that uh, they are not interfering. They're, we are not achieving the indistinguishability that's needed. When you are at the, at the switch pot, when you're indistinguishable, when the two photons are indistinguishable at the beam splitter, you go to what's called a home dip or this uh, home U Mandel effect. And we want to be sitting at time equals zero. Obviously, zero is uh, here arbitrary. We may get zero in the plot, but the way that we define zero is by going at the minimum of this plot. And this is a very hard measurement to do. Uh, it's actually, actually, you've seen the plot, then you know that you can do the whole protocol. So this is, I just wanted to point that out uh, and it's very clear you know quantum interference uh, effect that we that we have detected and the deeper the 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 closer it goes to zero the better is your your kind of protocol the better your final result is going to be the closer to one you're going to be in the plot on the right it's not expected to be zero because of the source uh, of the statistical uh, nature of the photon sources that we're using. So those are a bit details, but I, I wanted to mention that. So we did not expect to go to zero. We were actually, it's pretty close to to being, uh, you know, optimal in this case. And the next, sorry, I'm uh, probably running a, a bit behind, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, uh, but that was kind of the quantum uh, teleportation. The next protocol in complexity is what we call entanglement swapping, or uh, actually one of our students met with Anton Seilinger, uh, last year's uh, Nobel Prize, who was one of the first ones to demonstrate this, uh, this protocol. And he said, ah, actually, I prefer to call it uh, this uh the teleportation of entanglement. So now you have two pair sources and you basically interact. So they don't know about each other. You take one photon for each, you make them interact again with the Bellstein measurement. And now 
you have a pair that's entangled without ever having contact with each other. So, and again, that can only happen uh, using the, the properties or you know the nature of quantum mechanics. And that's what we're setting up to do. Here on the left, that's the comment about Seilinger about teleportation of entanglement. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, in the schematic diagram. Now we have two fully, you know, it's, it gets more complex. It has more detectors. Uh, it has two pair sources, so it's a bit more, and then you need to control the stability of which the sources, you know, at the same time. So everything gets far more complicated uh, by changing a little, by adding one more photon. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the experiment. Uh, and then at the end of the day, now you need a minimum of four SNSPDs now. So we're increasing the number of uh, SNSPDs that are required. And the DAQ system also, it's it's very important. And we had to develop, I wanted to say on the technology, we had to develop a dedicated DAQ and time to digital converting system to be able to run these protocols. Uh, because uh, as soon as you start adding complexity and number of photons, uh, you need to build your own. You, it, it doesn't work anymore. And the amount of data and the amount of fakes you have, uh, you need to be able to configure this to be able to run uh, your experiments. This is what it looks like uh, in uh, in the same lab. So the, the idea is that we will demonstrate this in one lab and then we'll take it apart into the two labs that we had at Fermilab and then we'll go to Argon. That's something that we've done in the past. And we're currently commissioning here inside uh, one of the labs downstairs uh, uh, that we have at the D0 uh, building. As one of our students tuning the filters to make these photons indistinguishable. And uh, as I said, the, 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 to try to get this moniplot, the home interference between the photons that are interacting at the beam splitter. So, and as I said, once you have that, you, you kind of pretty much are done, uh, then you need to optimize things. So this is some very preliminary results that we obtained a few weeks back uh, and we see clearly the home interference between a threefold. So now we have four photons, so you can do threefold coincidence or twofold coincidence and fourfold is just, you know, like the best you can do, but you're supposed to see it at the same location at the same time. And this has not been converted back, you see, to zero. It's like the raw data. So you see it at a particular, you know, arbitrary time, but you see that the both the threefolds at the top and the fourfolds at the bottom do align. So we have a pretty clear signature there we have the interference and the indistinguishability of the photons and with these numbers of visibility which is like you know how much is the contrast between the top and the bottom uh, we expect to have a high fidelity uh, swapping experiment uh, if you actually we have models that predict you know these different curves are two folds three folds and four folds and this blue band kind of tells us where we are in the in, in the uncertainty uh, and the x-axis is uh, indistinguishability, closer to one, the better. Uh, you, you figure out that now the swapping fidelity in this region will be around 80 to 90%. So, and that, that's very high results, uh, state-of-the-art results for these protocols with, with photons, with the length scales that, that we're addressing. So we're looking forward to the final results, but uh, it looks like we, we might have as we had before, you know, the high fidelities, which were rec uh, world record, uh, we might have this again for the swapping uh, experiment that we're conducting uh, right now. Uh, I think I, I can skip this. This is like saying that now if you have an interferometer, uh, the higher measurement is to change the face of the interferometer and see the sign uh pattern which is exactly what we see here so that's that's the signature for teleporting this like say phi plus the mixed state uh, uh that which was difficult to measure in, in my previous comments so that was also kind of the hard technological uh you know or measurement that we wanted to achieve so we've shown that we have the home the dips and we have this uh control of the interferometers because we had to change the interferometers from the previous experiment to the new one so I just wanted to show that we have under control all the key ingredients for running the experiment, and, and we're just collecting the you know last night final data sets to, to get the final results. And something that I wanted to highlight that we also did recently, uh, which is related to the time resolution of the detectors that we connected, uh, running a quantum protocol, which is simpler, uh, simpler called entanglement uh, distribution, uh, we run coexisting in the same fiber uh, clock distribution uh, signal with a lot of photons at a different wavelength. And we were able to show that 
at the other end at Argon, we are able to reconstruct the time, the clock, uh, with a resolution of about a few picoseconds, three picoseconds in this case, which is far better than the detectors themselves. And also over a long period of time, you know, of like, you know, a day or so. We didn't we didn't take more data, but it didn't seem like uh, you know, it was gonna fluctuate more. So this is again very important for quantum networks looking, you know, to make them more real world so we can use them, you know, uh, uninterrupted over long periods of time. You need to have this time synchronization. And again, this was again pretty significant result moving forward for time synchronization systems. Uh, okay, so how much time do I have? Uh, so I wanted to get to my second uh, part of the talk, which is how do we use now these detectors for uh, fundamental physics in the realm of dark matter? So I will, I will rush a little bit here, but uh, the main figure of merit here, or the easiest to understand is the energy threshold of the SNSPD. So the lower the energy threshold, the lower you can probe the dark matter mass. If you have a bosonic dark matter, which typically converts all its energy uh, into the mass, or oh, sorry, all the mass, all their mass into energy of the photon, then a 30 mV threshold gives you access to masses as low as 30 mV electron volt dark matter. And there, there is some interesting, you know, blind spot in the coverage uh, for axion detectors. So axion is a very well motivated dark matter candidate that uh, explains the strong CP problem. And uh, these particles under the you know, interaction with a magnetic field, they convert back into a regular photon and you can detect that. Typical experiments for axions is a cavity, which is this spot on the left. There's a magnetic field going up. Those are the lines. The axion comes in, it interacts with the magnetic field. Uh, it creates a photon of a particular frequency, which is resonant with that cavity. And then you read the photon out uh, and you see a peak uh, in in the axial mass, and we haven't seen it. Uh, and typically, the the frequencies or the masses for these experiments are very low, like micro EV or so forth. And this is what it's uh, shown here. So that's kind of the x is the mass of the axion, y is the sensitivity of the experiments, and there is this diagonal line which is the you know the QCD axion target, and you see that most of the experiments are targeting below. Uh, uh, milli EV in threshold, and there is this white space at higher uh, masses or longer, uh, sorry, higher wavelengths for photons because they are more difficult to achieve uh, experiments because of the photon detector. Uh, so again, uh, just to recap, uh, axion comes in. If you put a magnet, you have the magnetic field. If you put now uh, in yellow uh, a metal. In 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 the way too, the action comes in, and because of the metal, it, when the action interacts and creates the photon, the photon will go perpendicular to the surface, to the metallic surface. So we'll have a photon perpendicular to the surface, and that gives this idea of a, what we call a broadband reflector experiment for action detection. Typic so which is different from this cavity. That's what I wanted to emphasize. That typically cavities have this problem that you need to like tune the cavity resonance, and then you're only sensitive to that mass. If you want to be sensitive to another mass, you need to change your cavity. Well, in this case, uh, we have a way to explore different masses with the same kind of cavity or reflector. In this case, it's not a cavity, it's a reflector. So the photon will come, it will interact on the outer part of the yellow surface, it will create a photon perpendicular, and then we have this parabolic surface that will make it bounce once, bounce again on the metal, and then it will be collected in a focal plane. And the picture on the right shows this done for different locations in Z in which the photon interacts. And you see that all the dashed lines and the solid lines at the top, the purple ones interact at one particular focal point. So, so with this, and this is independent of the mass also of the axion. So the idea will be to put a photon detector right at the focal point. And that uh, obviously <laughs> for my talk, the, that photon detector will be a superconducting nanowire single photon detector. And that's exactly what I just said, that is a concept of what we will do. So again, we will have to have a cryostat. We will have the, the four Kelvin stage attached to the reflector. The photons will come in and then they will get collected at the at this at the SNSPD in purple. 
which needs to be a one millimeter by one millimeter. And that doesn't, uh, did not exist until recently. So we were doing the R&D to produce these sensors in this large form factor. If you remember the, the previous ones for the quantum communication were very small, about, you know, 100 micron, you know, square uh, transverse area. So these ones are significantly larger than that. So there are new challenges when you make them. And the idea will be that in the first experiment, we will run without the magnetic field because uh, there is another particle called a dark photon, which doesn't require the magnetic field to undergo the conversion, and it simplifies the experiment. So the first run will be uh, without the magnetic field looking for a dark photon, the same, uh, it's kind of the same plot, uh, coupling strength on the y-axis and uh, mass on the x-axis. And you see that the projected sensitivity for SNSPD is uh, around masses of 100 to, you know, like a thousand milli electron volts. And the SNSPD is the best uh, in that region. So that's that's what we're setting up to do. And this is a picture now of the detector. As I said, this is the first millimeter square detector ever fabricated uh, for uh, SNSPDs. And in the left is a picture of how it actually looks like when you really zoom in into it uh, to be able to see all the meanders. It actually is an eight pixel differential readout detector. And on the right, uh, it's uh, the actual package that you need to attach in the cold finger of your cryostat. Uh, and, and you see like the shiny part in uh, like, oh, sorry, it's not the shiny, it's actually opposite. Uh, it's kind of opaque part. In in front, in the middle, is the SNSPD inside all the packaging and all you know they require electronics to be able to read it out. And there's a lot of work. It's uh, undergoing by Christina Wang, one of the Caltech students uh, working with me. She got a DOE uh, graduate research scholarship uh, to come here at Fremelab to work on this for for a full year and complete her PhD thesis. And she's been doing all these measurements to characterize the dark counts of the detector and in the very first you know uh, cold down uh, she she obtained uh, uh, dark count rates of the order of 10 to the minus 3 which is very encouraging uh, for this very large area detector so the 10 to the minus 5 that i mentioned before was for these small detectors so and the process by which you make these SNSPDs uh, which are bigger it's completely different so it was basically anyone guesses uh, uh, what will be the dark count rate of these detectors so we're measuring already 10 to the minus three and the target is about 10 to the minus four uh, to you know get very good competitive results for the axion experiment uh, so it's actually now when you combine this plot with the efficiency so black is the efficiency uh, and blue is the dark counts you actually confirm this uh, 10 to the minus three number uh, when the efficiency of the detector is high so the, the previous plot only showed the dark count it was the very preliminary result, and now we like confirm that at the same point in X you have the current undergoing uh, going in the in the detector. Y is kind of efficiency or dark count depending on the on the curve. You see that at the same point that we achieve a very high efficiency, uh, we also achieve like a plateau on the dark counts, and we believe actually these are not intrinsic dark counts of the detectors; they are just photons going around in the cryostat so we're we're doing more work to figure out if uh, we can even reduce farther the dark counts uh, of the detector and the plan going forward is that we can uh, engineer these detectors so sorry these detectors are sensitive for photons of about one micron so one eV of energy and we're performing r d on you know the fabrication the the type of superconductor that you can use to lower the energy thresholds. This plot demonstrated uh, up to 18 microns on photon wavelength, which translated into energy, you can go down to 70 milli EV. And there was a recent result from one of my collaborators that showed that you can go down to about 30 milli EV for saturated efficiency. So that's kind of the it's ongoing R&D program to try to lower the threshold of these detectors and uh, there, there doesn't exist uh, at this wavelength so we will be able to cover more space in the mass plot here so remember the wavelength or the energy goes directly with the mass in this plot so that's a very important uh and this is what we predict uh what where we will be so snspds are are labeled there you know close to one ev uh and you know down to 30 milli ev 
and we have a progression in what we call IR1, IR2, and IR3. That's infrared one, two, and three uh, periods uh, for the R&D cycle development of these SNSPDs to cover and put this into the bread experiment. And as I mentioned before, bread is a nice concept because it allows you to have the same reflector and then uh, it's kind of an observatory and then you can change your detector to be able to get the best result you can. And we're trying to make the detectors as broadband as possible. Uh, but the most important R&D is to push to the left in this plot uh, to try to cover this. And you see that the predicted sensitivity it kind of meets this uh, horizontal yellow line, which is the, uh, the target sensitivity for the QCD axons. So probably I'm running out of time. So, and this is the collaboration uh, that we have formed. Uh, and, you know, there is a high impact and uh, opportunity in this field. And we're using now, again, uh, the, the advantages of SNSPD now to probe really fundamental physics in, in this case, uh, QCD or, you know, axion dark matter. So uh, I, there is other R&D for, you know, uh, now, this was bosonic dark matter. This is fermion dark matter. But uh, you know, you can ask me about it. Uh, I'll I'll just keep it because it's the same, very similar concept. Uh, it, it's a bit different, but uh, it's the same idea. So I think before confusing you, trying to go very fast and finish everything, I, I prefer to you know we can just go to the summary. Uh, it's the same detector actually. So uh, I wanted to highlight and I can uh, summarize. So we're uh, SNSPDs are enabling uh, a rich physics and technology program at Fermilab. It's a new technology that we have adopted uh, and we've been trying to push the envelope uh, with them for, as I say, quantum communications uh, in the networking protocols and more recently to enable new probes for dark matter with the possibility to reach ultra low thresholds and then therefore dark matter masses. It's a rich research program uh, ahead of us with the potential for very impactful science and also very exciting uh, opportunities, especially for young, talented people like Christina, one of the students that I showed before. She's made a tremendous impact on, on the program and, uh, and you know, uh, pushing these detectors forward to, to be able to have this outstanding performance. So that's all I got. Uh, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Christian, for very, very interesting talk. Uh, I guess there will be questions. Up. So Let me I, I, I see people clapping <laughs> on the chat. Do we have a question? So Mauro, raise his hand. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian, for your nice uh, talk um uh, my question my well, i guess my first question is uh, um regarding the the first part of your talk um, mm -hmm. um how do you how do you uh, deal with um decoherence uh, because if you want to have your entangled states uh, mm -hmm. if they decohere then they can destroy your signal uh, and, and so how do you deal with that? Because you have this long baseline experiment. Uh, uh, so I guess that's a problem or not? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, well, it's not a problem. It's something, it's a consideration in this case because of uh, how, how narrow the pulses are uh, for, the, for the length of the fibers that we're using, they're still pretty coherent. Uh, uh, so it hasn't been a, we haven't reached the uh, the limit. I forgot exactly what was, I think I did a calculation some time ago and then we'll have to go to like a thousand kilometers for the coherence time to become a problem. So, so the coherence uh, so far, you need to go to very long distances, uh, like thousand kilometers. And practically speaking, uh, the, the actual loss on the optical fiber, it's far more problematic than the coherence in this case. So, because typically the losses become kind of a problem now with the current fiber about like, you know, 100 kilometers. It's pretty hard to, to run these experiments with the current rates. Uh, so it, it will become a problem if we can improve the fibers on the source a lot. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, and and, and these, these losses are due to like, 
dispersive uh, uh, properties of the uh, fibers. Yeah, exactly. So it's typically for most optical fibers, like the problem probably you got, you know, running the internet, uh, it's about like 0.2 dB per kilometer. That's ideal. So like in a hundred kilometers, like a factor, it's 20 dB, it's a factor of 10 attenuation, uh, hundred, sorry, hundred attenuation because it's, it's log 10. That one, not, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, you said 0.2 dB per kilometer. That's like the best you get uh, if you had like a straight fiber. What actually happens in a lot of these links, that like the one that I show, uh, there are a lot of, you know, splices to go from, you know, building A, building B, and then go into the long fiber. So a lot of the, like, typically what we've seen is uh, you should have gotten 10, then just because of the splices, you get like double that. So, and that's another factor of 10. Uh, sorry, it's like, 10 in dB, so so double, uh, sorry, double in dB is 10 in real. So so it gets tricky when you right. go- Double in dB is speed. 10 in real, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, it, it, so for the 50 kilometer, I think we expected something about 12 or 11, and we measured 25, for example, just because of the splices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, so you, so you said dispersion is much a, 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 a worse problem than decoherence. Yes, yeah. Uh, so those oh. are more challenging problems. And then when you go to like a multi-node very far away, the synchronization uh, between the nodes was, uh, you know, a challenge because sometimes it's dedicated fiber you don't have many of them. So we had to study how you can put, you know, a clock signal, which has a lot of photons uh, in the fiber with the same as the quantum channel and see how much noise goes from the classical light into the quantum light. So that's all kind of new, like engineering or, you know, uh, research. There's not a lot of, you know, experience doing this. Mm -hmm. And and I I I I lost it um, as to the reason why you needed this uh, long baseline. Why do we need it? Uh, well, the so you don't need it to prove that you have the protocol working, but you do need it if you want to use it for something useful. So you know okay. the idea the idea is that or. There are many visions here, so you can, um, because it's all new. <laughs> uh, uh, so some people think that, uh, you know, to interconnect uh, future quantum computing technology, say, you know, sensors or actually quantum computers, you need to do them through the fiber infrastructure that's already deployed or new one that will be deployed together uh, current, concurrently with the one. So we will connect, say, for example, quantum computers with uh, this quantum proposals, uh, all quantum. So you, you don't want the quantum computer to go back to classical and then back to quantum. You want them all to be quantum. So okay. so that's that's kind of the vision. And and you want, you know, some critical infrastructure uh, around, you know, in metropolitan areas to be able to do this. And actually, there are some some ideas that to run physics experiments like axion detections if you have like them deployed at different locations and they're all kind of entangled with each other uh, through some similar protocol uh, through fibers uh, you can get enhancements for you know noise reduction so on and so forth so i don't work on that yet but it's you know it's it's an interesting perspective too for now more fundamental physics size of using the networks to do that okay thank you very much do we have more questions from the audience? I have a question. Yeah, please go. Well, ahead. hi, Christian. First, congratulations on, on this uh, great global efforts. A very new topic to me. But I was wondering one thing that you mentioned, two different protocols for uh, transmitting the quantum information, the entanglement and the swapping, I think was uh, the one called. And I understood that the, the goal is to basically maximize this uh, fidelity metric, which gives you the, the most amount of how much or how well the information was transferred, if I understood correctly. So what is the gain between the first method that you presented and the second one? 
or yeah, that is not the relevant question uh, that you well, basically that's a good question uh to clarify a few things uh well yeah i took a question let's put it that way uh the the first protocol is kind of the say the simplest one uh say let's go back to that one uh the picture because the, the second one, if the first one looked very complex, the second one looked completely very complex. So, so what is the gain, basically, I'm wondering, in, in, in going forward with the swapping one? Yeah, yeah. So, like, in it, you see, in this case, if you, uh, you wanted to teleport this information, right, uh, from here to here. Now, let's say this guy wants to do the same. So we'll have to do another, like, uh, relay to do that. Because if the distance is too long, then you don't you don't want to go in one go because you get hit by this uh, loss in the optical fiber. Then you can gain by going smaller in distance, and then actually uh, like this. This is what's called a quantum repeater. So that's a uh, you will do this once. You get the swapping in between these two ends, and then basically you can make a copy to the right or to the left and keep going. And that's what we do actually in, in current network infrastructure. We have repeaters and you get the signal, it gets amplified to account for the losses of the fiber and then you send it again. In this case, it, it doesn't get amplified because we cannot deal with that, but we, we benefit from having now higher rate sources running and then shorter distances so we can cope with the losses in the fiber. So that, that's kind of why this protocol is kind of important. It's the key for what's called a quantum repeater, which will, you know, you can keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. And there's a missing piece, which is a quantum memory, because as I said, ideally, if you want to implement this in real world, you need to wait for the other one to arrive. And you don't want to just synchronize with time. And, you know, that's like a physics experiment. If you want it for real deployment, then you need some kind of system that takes the information in the quantum regime again, without going to classical, it stores that quantum state without distorting it. It, it waits for the other one to arrive at, the, at this location. And then when they are synchronized, it releases them and it makes the velocity state measurement. So it's pretty pretty interesting you know, problem. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of interesting because it's at the intersection of, you know, in this case, technology and mm -hmm. physics. You need to you need to get your physics right to be able to run this thing. So, and I I, I haven't worked with memories yet. Uh, we're actually starting to work with them. Uh, it's pretty challenging, uh, uh, you know, to 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 do these experiments with the memories as well. So, as soon as you start adding more components, uh, it gets more complicated. And they're all kind of hybrid systems. They're not, you know, like the people that work with the pair sources don't do quantum memories. And we're one of the few efforts in the world that's trying to put it all together, because that's kind of one of the things that we have at National Labs that we try to scale up these technologies. And it's pretty challenging because you get like, you know, you get something and then something that hasn't talked to the like some technology and the other technology hasn't talked to the other one and you need to put it together. So yeah, it doesn't work. They need to go back and forth between these uh, technologies to figure out what's the right way to approach the problem and then put it all together. So. That, that's what I thought it was a it's a pretty good question because that that's the key to for the long term vision. Mm, okay, thanks. Do we have more questions? Because I do have a couple. <laughs> I don't see any, so I will just go with the first and easiest one, I think. So I guess the the resolution of the single the NSPDs uh, does this have to do with the time it takes for the superconducting uh, material to get back uh, to be superconductive again? So I understood that the photon comes and then it makes some heat and makes it come out of this superconductive uh, state and then it will, goes back. It. So I guess this is the the time window that makes the the sensor resolution. Uh, yes and no. So it has to do with with that. Uh, so the the actual time resolution. There are some new experts now in the 
in the audience, like Claudio, Orlando, and Rene, they know a lot about time performance now. So I'm not the only one, so I need to be careful with them. Uh, it, it Typically for this experimental part, it, it goes with the rise time of the signal. And uh, because the faster it goes, the better the time resolution and also how high it can go with respect to the noise. So typically the figure of merit goes as uh, the rise time, like uh, say the 10% to the 90% in time, that's divided by the signal to noise. So time that takes to rise to the maximum divided by the signal to noise in that region. Uh, so the main performance of the superconducting is that the signal to noise is pretty good. It's like uh, hundreds. Uh, and because the noise is very little and it's a very kind of digital signal, it goes from not signal to very big signal in very small time. And it's actually not when it, it goes back to superconducting is the time that it takes to get it out of the superconducting stage. So you were kind of almost there, but it, it's the time that... Uh, in in this plot until number four when it's like fully like uh, choked so it is because the time that it it it's kind of important because the time that it takes to go back actually in time is much longer uh to recover than it times to to get to the maximum so it's only the time that it's from when the photon hits to when it's like fully like non-superconducting in that area that that and that's typically it depends a little bit on how wide you make it right uh mm. the properties of the nanowire but it can you know typically it's like you know like a nanosecond uh, or a bit less than that and I then see. if you divide that by a signal to noise which is like order of a thousand then you get down to this like one picosecond level so that that's that's why the signal to noise is also very important thank you and um, my second and um, i guess last question uh, is uh, about the quantum networks uh, so what would you say is the biggest benefit of it? Uh, does it has to do with speed or maybe maybe ciphering or the keys? Speed and... is not at the moment. Uh, speed is one of the limitations currently. Uh, so it's actually most about like, uh, I mean, the one that a uh, typical answer you will get is the safety. Yeah, like if, as soon as you like try to like, spy on the photon that's kind of transmitted, then you collapse the wave function, right? Because you, you will mm. measure it. That's a property of quantum mechanics. So it's completely secure. Uh, and in that sense, I mean, it's not completely secure. You need to run some extra protocols, which are more complex to figure out that you've been spied on. So that's something that, you know, classical systems do not have. I mean, we have like normal encryption, but, you know, the quantum encryption, it's harder to crack. Uh, that's the main benefit, uh, like for practical point of view. Uh, and then basically now we've been saying, uh, it depends a little bit on, you know, what the final quantum computing technology will be. But a lot of people think that the way that these things, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're like these dilution refrigerators. Mm. You can fit 100 qubits, 100 qubits for computers now, uh, not these photon ones. That's kind of the big one that you will get. But if you want to have like a computer with thousands or you know tens of thousands, probably it's not, not going to fit in one big cryostat. It's maybe more scalable to fit like 10 cryostats next to each other and connect them with optical fiber and then make them talk to each other. Maybe that's more realistic. Uh, so that's one approach in which uh, keeping the protocols running in quantum now in fiber, it's more scalable to create these uh, large cryostats. Uh, instead of creating a you know, humongous cryostats, uh, see, uh, that I will see. be like the size of a building. So, uh, it's a bit of, you know, uh, nobody knows what the final quantum computer will look like. So, <laughs> uh, so we, we are a little bit uh, on that front. And on the, you know, uh, on the political, you know, <laughs> part uh, at least for the US I shouldn't say this too uh, but uh, there is a little bit of a race right like what it's like uh, a lot of people are working on this and you know we don't want to be behind it so so we we're also it and for me it's just interesting <laughs> so it's uh, it's mostly also that but uh, there there are some very key benefits from it that we expect uh, and that's what drives all the investment uh it's well motivated but uh it's also very very cool so it's both of them combined yeah it's incredibly uh so i would just give uh, mauro the last question uh, because we are short on time so mauro please 
Yeah, thank you, Pedro, for that. Uh, so I have one further question, Christian, but it's not directly related to your talk, but rather say to the environment in which you're in. Uh, do you know of people entertaining the idea of using topological insulators for doing these kinds of experiments as a, and, and using them as optical fibers? Uh, I'm actually not familiar with that topic. So I wouldn't say yes or no, because I might just be completely off. So, I mean, I don't know, but uh, uh, I wouldn't discard it. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, I, I will have to get back to you on that one. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. Okay, I, I, I will send you an email maybe to discuss yeah, yeah, that yeah. because yeah, they, they, they are maybe, very interesting. Maybe, maybe, in, maybe I need to ask questions <laughs> to, to get to the bottom of the answers. Uh, but at the moment, I, I, I don't know. But uh, I did. Maybe let, let me try to put it this way. So it doesn't sound like a, uh, there it's, as I said before, there is a lot of hybrid technologies. So like even for these memories that I was describing before, you can have like 10 different groups, like, uh, you know, Stanford, Caltech, uh, all these big, you know, name universities, they all have like a group that they typically go with the main PI and they specialize in this technology. They, the thing at the end of the day needs to do the same thing. It's like a memory, quantum memory. It needs to hold the photon until we need it. But there are 10 different ways to implement that. Uh, and that means like, you know, one of these technologies could be the one that, that you're measuring. So just to measure one that I know of, like quantum memory is a very diverse way to do it in terms of technologies. And it's a very, you know, active field. Uh, same for you know quantum transducers, changing photons from one wavelength to the to another wavelength. Because to go from fiber, you need to go in 15, 50 nanometer, because the loss of the fiber is minimal at those wavelengths. But typically, quantum computers don't work at those wavelengths. So you need to change the wavelength of the photon again in quantum without distorting it and making it at 15, 50 nanometer uh, for the fiber. So there is a lot of hybrid technologies that are needed. So I, there might be some use uh, of you know, uh, topological insulators in this case that I, I just don't know. But I just wanted to make the point that it's a very active field for all these technologies that are needed. So we should probably follow up on that. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I would like to Thank you again, Christian, for this very nice talk and all the people that connected. Uh, I hope to see you soon for the next webinar. And I guess this is where we say goodbye. So thank you for the invitation. Bye. Yeah, thank you again. Bye. Thanks, Christian.